Okay. Okay, we're gonna have to change angles, buddy. Hold on. <laughs> All glory to the Chime God. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son, <clears throat> the Father's heart that became flesh, the eternal Word, who is Yehovah, Jehovah God of the Hebrew Scriptures, one with the Father and the Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bless this session. Destroy all distractions of Satan. Surround us with a wall of fire from Holy Spirit, my Father. A wall of fire from your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. A wall of fire from your glorious presence, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Wash our loved ones in the blood of Jesus. My daughters, wash them in the blood of Jesus. And please, Father, bless this session. As you did the previous session, anoint me by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak truth without error, to recall scripture, interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus. With passion from your spirit and bless your people, Father, to understand the things they hear and empowered by your spirit to live them out for the glory of Jesus, Father. And I pray <clears throat> that I won't be a stumbling block to anyone. Purify my motives, not to tickle ears or to be a crowd pleaser and not to be unnecessarily offensive, Father. And please bless this session and have your way in this session. Have your way with us, Father. Please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, we need you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Bless the internet connection, Father, for your glory, and that I won't be a stumbling block <clears throat> to my brother. Bless him, Father, for allowing me to use his internet and his home to serve your people, the church, the body of Jesus Christ, for the glory of Jesus by the power of Spirit. Again, we say we love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Father, Son, Spirit, we love you. We are in love with you. And we worship you in Jesus' name. Okay. Uh, guys, this is as loud as I can get because it is rare for me to come on at 10 at night, 10 at night, while my brother is sleeping upstairs. So pray for him, my oldest brother. Pray for all my siblings. Just to let you know, I'm the youngest of six. Four boys, two girls. And though my five older siblings professed to be Christians and went to church and were baptized, they really do not follow Jesus Christ. So pray for their salvation, for those who are not saved among them. Three older brothers, two older sisters. Pray for their children and grandchildren that every one of them will truly know Jesus, fall in love with Jesus, to be born of the Holy Spirit, Wash in the blood of Jesus Christ and walk in obedience to the Lord and pray for us that we can be more passionate in love with the Lord Jesus, to obey him more perfectly and serve him more perfectly and love him more completely for the glory of Jesus Christ. Isn't it ironic? Here's what's ironic. <clears throat> the Lord uses me to preach throughout the world via social media, YouTube, the blog, the websites, Facebook. And the Lord Jesus has been pleased to use me by the power of the Holy Spirit to open the hearts and minds of people to follow over Jesus. And yet, I have yet to see any of my family members just surrender to Jesus Christ completely and serve him. Is that an ironic? And yet I know family members, people. There's one sister in particular, a Persian, a Persian sister who came to know Jesus Christ in the 90s, I believe it was late 90s, used to come to my Bible studies 
when I said teach them. In Jesus' name, may bless the internet connection. Please, Lord Jesus. Remove all buffering, please, Lord Jesus. Anyway, we're going to have to deal with the issue of buffering. And so she, around 2001, used to come to my Bible studies. Did you know that God was pleased to use her and to see, I believe, over 90% of her Muslim family members come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and give their life to Jesus Christ and fall in love with Jesus Christ. So pray for us. Pray for 1611 on his way to heaven. He just said, me too, Sam, my wife, kids. So pray for the salvation of his spouse and children. So pray for him. All right. Yep, it's buffering. Hopefully it doesn't get bad. Yeah. Okay, pray the buffering goes away in Jesus' name. I've been missing you, 1611. I hope you've been able to watch the sessions that have been archived. Pray for strong internet. Yep, it's going to be buffering because the internet here is not the best. So we have to do with what we have, you know, make the most of it. Anyway, the reason why I decided to do a, lot, a late session right now, and if the buffering goes away and if it's not too bad, I'll do as much as I can. I want to respond to a Muslim meme, meme, M-E-M-E. -M -E. If you click on that, you'll see a meme contrasting with what the Bible teaches with what the church teaches. Okay, so I want to deal with this because I want to make this YouTube channel, if the Lord Jesus is pleased, the most thorough, thorough YouTube channel addressing all the major issues and criticisms against the core doctrines of the Christian faith, like the Trinity, Jesus as the God-man, the divine person of the Holy Spirit, salvation by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone, the authority of the Bible, the scriptures, the preservation, the historical accuracy. I want to do all I can to the best of my ability to make this website or YouTube page, I should say, YouTube channel, one of the most thorough, thorough, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. YouTube channel, one of the most thorough and comprehensive databases to equip Christians on defending their faith, affirming their faith, proclaiming their faith, knowing their faith, living out their faith, loving their faith, and teaching others. Right? Give me one second. I'm going to turn off the TV. Would that help you think if I turn off the TV? A Protestant believer would know. If the TV is on, okay, so that would help if I turn off. Okay, hold on a second. Don't hate. And don't hate that I'm so handsome. No, yeah, no, I wasn't turning off the TV so much because you could hear it. I didn't know you could hear it. I wanted to turn off to see maybe it would make the internet connection stronger. Right? Yeah, wow, thank you, Razzle. Hold on. Shh. Sorry, guys. This is what happens when you live stream. You're right. Man, Razzle, you dazzle me, Razzle. Uh, Anoshka. I will be shouting and screaming at the top of my lungs, and I'm going to shut you down, and I'm going to hunt you down, and I'm going to lay hands on you. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, Zanher, I learned this technique of clickbaiting from 
Christian Prince. Because if you watch some of Christian Prince's titles, they're catchy. How Shamsi embarrassed Christian Prince. So I decided to imitate him to get some of his 900 viewers because I'm jealous and envious and I want all the viewers for myself. I want all the attention. <laughs> no, but hey, by the way, you know what I just found out? I found out because YouTube ch changed its rules. All the comments in all my previous videos have been deleted. You know why? I used to click on the option saying that it is for children. And because they change their policies, anything that you do for children, they disable comments. Did you know that? So you guys who are now live streaming and doing videos, you have to. Yeah, I'm Sheikh Afan Sanspir. Afan Sanspir, do my name. Yeah, Adam Sheikh, in Jesus' name, please, Lord, bless this connection. Any of you who are doing live stream, you're doing live stream, you're going to have to say it's for mature. It's not for children. Because if you click on the option that it's for children, they will disable your comments. So you're going to have to change. So all the previous comments on my videos, because I used to click on it is for children, gone. I don't know DHC, but it's gone. Anyway, in Jesus' name, let me give you the link. Here's the link. By the grace of Jesus Christ, I'm hoping to get as much done. This is as loud as I can get. I can't get louder because I don't want to wake up my my brother and he gets angry and throws me out. Yep. So let's trust the Holy Spirit to guide the conversation, to keep us safe from all distractions. And I don't distract anyone, you know to keep my brother asleep for the night by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I won't be too loud. And let's deal with this meme. You guys got to click on, and I'm going to put the link to the meme in the description box. You guys got to click on the link and you'll see it's a Muslim site, a Muslim site. And this is what it says. It's trying to show you that what your church teaches you about the Trinity is not found in the Holy Bible. Okay. So you click on it. And here you go. The Facebook page is called Discover the Right Path. And you're right. Discover the right path of our God, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Muhammad's God, judge and destroyer. But it's obviously a Muslim site trying to mislead you by misquoting the Bible to show that the Bible points to Islam. Okay. So now, when you click on it, you're going to see this is what the meme says. On the left, to my left, Bible verses, and on the right, what the church supposedly teaches in contradiction to the Bible. So it says, what church teaches you? What church teaches you? So now, let's go through it. On the left, the Father is greater than I, John 14, verse 28. To the right, supposedly what the church teaches, Jesus is equal to the Father. On the left, the Lord our God is one Lord, Mark 12, 29. By the way, these are all the words of Jesus Christ. So they're quoting the words of Jesus Christ. The Lord our God is one Lord. On the right, you're taught by the church, God exists as three persons. On the left, by myself I can do nothing. John 5, verse 30. On the right, Jesus is all-powerful. On the left, finally, John 20, 20, 17 is quoted, I have sent to my Father and your Father. On the right, Jesus is the only Son of God. Now, I'm going to refute every one of those distortions by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Holy Spirit enables me to do so. But I'm going to give you first dibs on deciding. And by the way, if you read my articles and go through my YouTube channel, I've addressed every single one of these passages over and over and over again. Ad nauseum ad infinitum. In fact, on David Wood's Acts 17 apologetics channel, I believe, or is it the Yahya one? David recorded me doing a response to John 14, 28, roughly 13 minutes. And that video went viral. So I've already addressed all these. But again, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it sinks in by the grace of God's spirit and that we can absorb the information and share it and use it in our witness. And with that said, <clears throat> which of those... Objections do you want me to address first? 
I want to give you first dibs and majority rules. Which one of those passages? John 14, 28. John 20, verse 17. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Yeah, you know, I think maybe that would be a good one, right? Mark 12, 29. Okay. Let's see. So far, someone said John 20, 17. How can Jesus be the only son? Yeah, hit the like button, please. Please do hit the like button. You know, so we can keep this growing. Okay, three of you said John 20. All right. I think we'll do John 20. All right. Let's do John 20. Okay, can we do John 20? Yeah, Stephen, I'll be doing Mark 12, 29, but the majority rules. Three voted to your one, and nobody else is voting because no one else is listening, right? Hopefully we get about 200 people today. If not, I'm going to cry myself to sleep, right? One day, one day, I will catch up. We'll have 900. Oh, yes. All right. John 20, verse 17. Jesus Christ, our Lord, says to Mary Magdalene, Stop clinging to me. Jesus says to her, do not touch me. Stop clinging to me, for I have yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, go to my brethren and say, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Let's look at it again. We'll quote it from the King James Version. John 20, verse 17. Guys, this is where I'm going to need your undivided attention and that you pray that the Spirit fills us and blesses this session. John 20, verse 17. Okay. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So how can the church say Jesus Christ is the only Son when here he says that all of the disciples, his brothers, those who believe in him, those who trust in him, those who have been set apart, God is their father too, and they are children of God. Okay, this is the objection. Let's now refute it by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I want to teach you how to interpret scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit, because <clears throat> he's the perfect teacher and uses imperfect vessels like me. And I want to teach you how to turn objections against those perverting scripture. Since this is a Muslim, who's quoting John 20, 17. You say, congratulations. What do you mean? I want to congratulate you. Why? I want to congratulate you for destroying Islam and proving Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist. Great job. Thank you. You've now convinced me I can never be a Muhammadan. I can never be a Muslim. By quoting this passage and assuming these are the words of the historical Jesus, that Jesus, who walked this earth, uttered those words. You have now proven to me Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist. And most of you know where I'm going with this. Now, just want to make sure you guys can hear me, right? Okay. Yep, 1611 got it. According to the following passages, according to the following passages, 1611 got it. Passages of the Quran. Write these down. We're not going to quote all of them. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 6, verse 101 of the Quran. Write these down, 6101. Chapter 9, verse 30, which we'll come back to. Chapter 9, verse 30. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Surah Al-Maryam, chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Right? Chapter 21, verse 26. Chapter 21, verse 26. Write these down, folks, or go back and listen. Chapter 39, verse 4, and finally, after chapter 39, verse 4, finally, chapter 72, verse 3. All of these passages affirm the following. Allah is a father to no one. He's definitely not a father biologically. He doesn't have sex and sire children biologically, which we would also agree. God is a spiritual being. He doesn't have sex, and he doesn't sire ch children. Biologically, that's blasphemy. But neither is he a father, metaphorically or spiritually. He has no children of any kind. The Jews are not his children. Christians are not his children. Jesus is not his son. And the highest relationship you can have to, with Allah is a slave-to-master relationship. A slave 
to master relationship. Okay, now let's look at chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. Follow with me. Hey, we're job, we're losing people. I guess the clickbait ain't working. Okay, chapter 5, verse 18. All right, notice here. Chapter 5, verse 18. The Jews and Christians say, we are sons of Allah. Notice, the Christians at Muhammad's time, along with the Jews, are telling Muhammad, we are the sons of Allah. We are the sons of Allah. And his loved ones say, why then doth he chastise you for your sins? Nay, ye are but mortals of his creating. He forgiveth, forgiveth whom he will, and chastiseth whom he will. Allah's the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth, and all that is between them, and unto him is the journeying. Okay, did you catch it? You Christians are not the sons of Allah. You're not his loved ones. You do not <clears throat> relate to him as a child does to a father. Proof that you're not his children, he will punish you for your sins. Now, only in Muhammad's mind could, it, could God discipline, disciplining believers be taken as a denial that we are his children, right? Now, with that said, what did John 20 verse 17 say? Jesus said, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So Jesus is God, is Jesus' father, and the disciples' God is the disciples' father. So according to John 20, 17, chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran is a lie. Muhammad is a liar and an antichrist because he denies that God is the father of Jesus and the father of the followers of Jesus. Good job, Muhammad. Excellent. Way to go. Chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran. Chapter 9, verse 30. Watch here. It's going to get better. Chapter 9, verse 30. And the Jews say, Ezra <coughs> is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. That is their saying with their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved of old. Allah fighteth against them. How perverse are they? Oh, so catch it. If you say, Jesus is the son of Allah, you are a pervert, you imitate the unbelievers of the past, and Allah will fight you and kill you for saying that Jesus is the son of Allah. But wait, Muslim, you just quoted John 20 verse 17 to prove Jesus is not the only son of God. God has many sons. He's a spiritual father to all believers. But inciting that, you just destroyed the Quran and proved Muhammad is an antichrist. Wow. Wow. I hope I'm loud enough because I can't get any louder. Is it clear? You see what I just did? I took the very passage that they quoted and turned it against Muhammad to prove Islam is a false religion. But now, why do we say that Jesus is the only son of God when Jesus said all believers in him, all of his followers are his spiritual brothers and therefore are spiritual children of God, that his father is their father. So why do we say that Jesus is the only son of God? You know what's ironic? Here's what's ironic. This very gospel, this very gospel affirms that Jesus is the only Son of God and that all believers are the sons of God. Okay, now let's go to John 1, 12 to 14. John 1, 12 to 14. Let's do some analysis. Okay. Okay, let me show you. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received them, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So notice, John begins his gospel by saying, all who believe in Jesus Christ, all who trust in Jesus Christ, all who love Jesus Christ, Jesus gave them the right, the power, the authority to become sons of God. Who gave 
them the right to become children of God? Jesus Christ, our Lord, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now watch this. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, wow. You mean the same gospel that says believers are the sons of God? Is the same gospel that says that Jesus is the only begotten, the one and only son of God? So this gospel affirms both? Hmm. You see, there's the, the gospel, the author who was inspired by the Spirit John, saw no problem in affirming that Jesus is the only Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, and that believers are also sons of God. He saw no problem with both propositions being true. Are you with me? He affirms both. Jesus is the only Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, and believers are sons of God, born of the Spirit. But here's what's beautiful. As we unpack this, I want you to go click on John 1.12 to look at the Greek of John 1.12. If you see the word for sons, it's tekna theou. The word for sons is tekna theou. Tekna. Children, sons of God. Okay, do you guys see it? I gave you the link to the interlinear on BibleHub.com. Tekna theou. Do you guys see it? The word tekna is the word sons or children. Tekna the you. You guys see that? Just let me know that you're seeing this. I'll just do this objection for tonight, God willing, and we'll do the rest later. Okay. Did everyone see it? Now, <clears throat> the word that John uses to single out Jesus' sonship is weus. Weus. Let's look at John 118. Can you guys post John 118? No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. Only begotten Son. Guys, I want you to click on that link. The Greek of John 118. When you look at the Greek. John 1 18, you're going to see. I'm sorry, I gave you the. Let me give you another one because this is based on. Yes, my, my apologies. This is based on earlier papyri, whereas the King James is based on the majority text reading, specifically the received text. Hold on. Sorry about that. It's the beauty of modern technology. Here you go. If you go here, and you click blueletterbible.com, you're going to see it down. You see, you're going to see this. Oh, this is very awful. Oh, my God. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, please, my Father. Jesus, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Sorry, it's buff. Here's what you're going to see. Okay. Click on it. You're going to see this word. Paul, monogenes. monogenes. This is what you're going to see. I'm going to put in all caps. We use. We use there the word for son is different did you guys know that this word for son we use we use h y i o s transliterating the greek into english h y i o s did you know john never uses that word to describe the sonship of believers john uses two different words in order to highlight the difference in Jesus' sonship with the sonship that believers enjoy because of the grace of Jesus. When it comes to believers, the word he uses is tekna. We are the tekna of God, tekna theyu. But when it comes to Jesus, he uses weus, weus, son, a term that John does not use to describe Christians as children of God. Do you know that? So someone reading the Greek of John would automatically see the difference between Jesus' sonship and believer's sonship. In fact, that difference is even highlighted in John 20, verse 17. And I'm going to come back to the word monogenes in a minute. 
John 20, verse 17. Let's reread it. So far, are you with me? Is it making sense? Am I confusing you or are you following along? I know it's a late, light, a late night session, but still. Okay. John 20, 17. The careful reader is going to notice that Jesus did something that almost seems like it's like superfluous, right? He said something that he could have said in fewer words. He made a long statement that he could have condensed and said in fewer words. Notice what Jesus did not say. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto our Father and our God. Why did Jesus make what could have been stated in a more succinct manner? He could have simply said, tell them I'm ascending to our Father and our God. But no, notice, he has to make it longer and say, tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Even this statement shows that Jesus, though affirming that believers in him are children of God, they are children in a different way than he is. Okay, now let me explain the difference. Okay, let me explain the difference. The Father of our Lord Jesus is our Father, but not in the same sense. God is Jesus' Father, essentially. Jesus is the true spiritual offspring of God, whereas God is the Father of believers by grace through faith in Jesus. So Jesus is saying, He's my Father and your Father, but our relationship to Him is not identical. He is my father by nature. He's your father by grace. He's my father, essentially. I'm truly his son, always been a son. You have been adopted to be his children because of me. Even when he says that the father is his God, he even differentiates that relationship. Did you pay attention? He even differentiates that relationship. He doesn't say in our God, my God and your God. Why? Because now... Here's where I need you to focus and follow me. Just like God is Jesus' father by nature, but the believer's father by adoption, the father is Jesus' God by adoption, whereas he's the believer's God by nature. What do I mean? The disciples are creatures of God, and so by nature they have a God over them. The Father only became Jesus' God when Jesus adopted our human nature. So the Father is Jesus' God by adoption. When Jesus took on, adopted, took to himself the nature of man. Whereas the disciples are human creatures who by nature are humans. And so by their very nature, the Father is their God. As creatures, you have a God. They are creatures by nature, so the Father is automatically their God because the Father is the one who created them. Whereas Jesus is not a, nature, a creature by nature, Jesus is not a creature by nature, but by adoption because he adopted, he took on a human nature. When he took on that human nature, the Father then became his God. So the Father is the disciples' God in a different sense than he is Jesus' God. The Father is the disciples God in a different sense than he is Jesus's God. The Father is the God of the disciples by their very nature as creatures. Being creatures, the Father is their God. But the Father is Jesus's God by virtue of the Son adopting the nature of man by becoming human. Did it sink in or did I confuse you guys? Before I move on. Okay. Sink in? Okay. Let me repeat again, because i got to repeat more than once. God is Jesus' Father by nature, whereas he is the disciples' Father by grace, by adoption. The Father is the disciples' God by their nature as creatures. By their very nature, the Father is their God, whereas he's Jesus' God by adoption, by virtue of the fact that Jesus adopted 
to himself, took on to himself a human nature. So God the Father relates to Jesus differently from the way he relates to the disciples. God is Jesus' father by nature because Jesus is the true, unique offspring, spiritual offspring, spiritual, not physical, biological, spiritual son of God. Whereas he is the father of disciples by grace, by adoption, through their faith in Jesus. The father is the God of the disciples by their very nature. By nature, they have a God over them because they are creatures, no more, no less. And so the father is their God by nature, by virtue of the fact that their very nature is that of a creature created by the father. Whereas Jesus is not a creature by nature. He's a creature by adoption. By creature, I mean, he created a physical body, a human nature, and took to himself a created human nature, created physical body, when he entered the womb of his blessed mother and caused her to conceive his physical body, human nature. So by adopting human nature, the father becomes his God. And by adopting the disciples into the family of God, they then become children of God. Is that, is that clear? Do you see why Jesus is careful in the way he even expresses God's relationship to him and them? Even the way Jesus expressed the relationship, he didn't express it to show they relate to God in the same way. Even in the way he expresses the relationship, he shows there's a distinction. My father and your father, when he could have simply said, our father. My God and your God when he could have simply said, our God. Even the way Jesus, because he's the perfect communicator, possessing infinite wisdom, who speaks perfectly and cho chooses the correct and right words in the right manner, even the way he expressed it shows the way he relates to God is not the same way that the disciples relate to God. Making sense? Making sense, right? So even that verse, even that verse backfires against the Muslims. It shows, right? Jesus relates to God in a unique way that is different, qualitatively different from the way the disciples relate to God the Father. So far with me, right? Notice I kept saying the father became Jesus' God when Jesus adopted a human nature, took on to himself a human nature. The father wasn't always Jesus' God. Though Jesus has always existed as the son, so he's always been the son of God, the word of God, the very heart of God, the father hasn't always been his God. When did the father become Jesus' God? Well, you know where I'm going with this. Protestant knows where I'm going with this. Let's read John 1, 1 to 3. Well, let's read John 1, verses 1 of 4 and 14. John 1, verses 1 of 4 and 14. All right, let's see. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. All things were made by the word, this eternal word that existed before creation, existed in fellowship with God the Father, who existed as God in nature. Okay? All things were made by that word. And without him, without the word, was not anything made that was made. In him, in the word, was life, and the life was the light of men. Now notice verse 14. And the word was made flesh. See, he became flesh at a point in time. Though the word always existed, eternally existed, existed before creation. And he's the one that the Father used to bring all creation into existence, to create everything, give life to everything, illuminate everything. The Word didn't always exist as flesh. The Word was made flesh at a point in time when he entered the womb of his blessed virgin mother who conceived his physical body, his human nature, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, put on your thinking caps. The Word was with God the Father, so there are two, the Word and God the Father. So he's not God the Father. 
but the word shares the nature of the father because he bears the nature of God. The word of God, the father became flesh. The father didn't become flesh. He remained in heaven. Since the father is God and the word became flesh, then it shouldn't surprise us that when the word became flesh, the father then became his God. Why? Because let's go to Jeremiah 32, 27. Jeremiah 32, 27. Jeremiah 32, 27. Watch here. Let's go. Okay. Notice Jeremiah 32, 27, folks. Pay attention to this. Behold, I am the Lord, Jehovah, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Let me repeat that twice. Twice more. Behold, I am Jehovah. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. I, Jehovah, am the God of all flesh. Is there anything hard, too hard for me? One more time, so it can sink in by the power of the Spirit. Behold, I am the Lord, Yahovah, Jehovah, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Okay. The Father is Jehovah. The Son is Jehovah. The Holy Spirit is Jehovah. They're not the same person. They're three eternal relationships, different persons that exist as the one God. That means the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the God of all flesh, right? If the Son, like the Father, is God, along with the Holy Spirit, that means Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three persons who exist as one God, they're the God of all flesh, right? I wanted to sink in so you know where I'm going with this before I move on. Okay. First God, it's Steve got it. Okay. Radical got it. Okay. Now follow with me. Follow with me. Since the word became flesh, not the father, and the father is the God of all flesh, why would it surprise you that when his eternal son, who is God, when he became flesh and took on this human nature, the father then became his God from the moment the son became flesh? Why would it surprise you? If the Bible is consistent, wouldn't we expect that if one person of the Godhead, the Word, the Son, became flesh, that from the moment of his becoming flesh, the Father becomes his God? Because he now has the nature of a creature. He created a physical body, human nature, that he took to himself. And by taking that nature of a creature, the Father becomes his God. Why would it surprise you? Jeremiah 32, 27. Why would that surprise you? Do you see the beautiful consistency in the testimony of Scripture? Behold, I am Jehovah, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Does it now make sense? Why the Father could be Jesus as God and God be Jesus as Father? Because he's the God-man. He is truly divine, eternally divine, eternal person, but then took on human nature. Clear? Is it making sense before I move on to the next point? I just want to make sure because I want to see enough once to make If anyone's confused, let me know. Now, don't forget what Jeremiah 32, 27 says. Jehovah is the God of all flesh. Now, follow with me because I'm adding now to the argument. I just said, according to John 1, Jesus is the word who eternally existed, not as flesh. He wasn't always flesh. He eternally existed as spirit, because as God, his nature would be spiritual. So he is the word, according to John 1, 1 to 4, that was there before creation, that was there in fellowship with God, meaning God the Father, and was there existing as God in nature and created all things. So if I'm right that the Father, because he's God, he's a God of all flesh, and the Son, because he's God, he's a God of all flesh, and the Holy Spirit, because he's God, he's a God of all flesh. If I'm right that the three persons of the Godhead eternally exist as God, then Jesus, too, would be the God of all flesh, right? If he's not just man, but he's also God, then he, too, would be the God of all flesh. Now, since the disciples of Jesus are human creatures, they are flesh, 
it makes sense that the Father is their God. But wait, if Jesus is also God, then that means Jesus is also the God of the disciples, right? The disciples are flesh. They're human creatures of flesh. So the Father is their God. But if Jesus is God, then that means he's also their God, right? And let's see what we find in the same chapter of John 20, 17. John 20, 27 to 29. Let's see if my logic is right, if it's consistent with the Bible. John 20, 27, 29. Let's see if my logic is consistent with the Gospel of John. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, said unto him, Ipen auto, not to someone else, to him. There's no way of getting around this grammatically. To him, Jesus, standing before him. My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen yet have believed. Okay, I'm confused. In that same chapter, John 20, the Father is the God of the disciples, and Jesus is the God of the disciples. The Father is the God of Thomas, and Jesus is the God of Thomas. Thomas worships Jesus as his Lord and God, my Lord and my God, and Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't say, hey, shame on you. Then I just tell you the Father is your God? Don't add me as another person who's your God. God is one, and it's only the Father. That's not what Jesus said. You had to see me to believe that? Blessed are those who do not see me, Thomas, yet believe that I am their Lord and their God. So wait, Jesus is not the Father. They're different persons. But Jesus, along with the Father, is the God of Thomas and the God of all the disciples. But there's only one God. So the Father is the God of the disciples, including Thomas. Jesus is the God of the disciples, including Thomas. The Father and Jesus are not the same person. But there's only one God. Oh, no wonder we're Trinitarians. Hmm. But let me blow you away a little more. It's going to get better. I hope this is blessing you guys, and I'm not torturing you guys because I can't speak loud. Oh, it's going to get better. Uh -huh. Here's the link. Here's the link to the Greek interlinear. Here's the link to the Greek interlinear. Did you know what the Greek says? What John writes in Greek that Thomas's expression, my Lord and my God, in Greek happens to be? Okay, here's what it is. Ha or o kuriosmo. Ha kuriosmo. That's the Rasmian way. O kuriosmo. Uh, o kuriosmo. The Lord of me. K or Kai. Sorry, K, Kai. O Theosmo. O Theosmo. The God of me. Literally, the Greek has Thomas saying, Jesus, you are the Lord of me and the God of me. Here's a link to the Greek. Do you see the definite articles? Do you see the definite articles? Thank you, Brother Panos. You can blame the Erasmian scholars, the scholars of the Greek New Testament that pronounce it what's called the Erasmian pronunciation. Anyway, key. Okay, if you click on it, here's the link to the Greek. And the Greek speakers can confirm. Do you see the definite article before Kyrios and uh, Theos, it's the Lord of me, the God of me. Do you guys see it? Let me let me transliterate the Greek. O Kyriosmo, 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 Kyriosmo. O is the word the, the Lord of me. And then it says O, O Theosmo. Okay. Oh, Theosmo. The God of me. Do you guys see that? Does everyone see that the Greek literally, I know that, Pistol Pete. I know that, brother. God bless you guys. So you can speak the language of the Greek New Testament. Okay. Guys, 
do you see that the Greek of John 20, 28, it literally says, the Lord of me, the God of me. He's the God of me, the Lord of me. The definite article is before the word Lord and God. Do you guys, uh, did you see that? I just want to make sure you saw it. Do you guys see it? Thomas calls Jesus the Lord of me and the God of me. That's who you are. The Lord of me, the God of me. Okay, do you know why? Because in John 20, 17, John 20, 17, where Jesus says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. You know, when Jesus says, I'm ascending to my God and your God, there is no definite article. The definite article is omitted. He doesn't say, I'm ascending to the God of me and to the God of you. There is no definite article. He simply says in Greek, I'm ascending to God of me and God of you. No definite article. And yet later on in that same chapter, when Thomas calls Jesus, my God, the definite article appears before the word God. So that Thomas literally says, the God of me. Whereas when Jesus speaks of the Father, he doesn't say, the God of me and the God of you. It's God of me and God of you. No definite article. Wow. Wow. There's the link to the Greek, and I'm going to read it for you. It's ke theon mu, accusative, ke theon mu, ke theon humon. No definite article. Oh, my goodness. Joe's witnesses, you have problems. If the lack of the article before the word God makes it a God, Jesus just said the Father is a God and not the great God, if we employ Jehovah Witness logic. Oh, my goodness. That means Jesus is the God Almighty and the Father is a God. Because in John 20, 17, there is no definite article before God. So according to JW logic, this would have to make the Father a God. But the definite article is used in John 20, 28, when Thomas calls Jesus his God. Jesus is the God of Thomas. Oh, my goodness, Jehovah's Witnesses. Using your logic, we just proved that the Father is a God and Jesus is the God Almighty. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. Did it sink in? Did it sink in? Do you understand what you just learned? John 20, 28. Jesus is said to be the God of me. Definite article. But in John 20, 17, same chapter, when Jesus speaks of the Father and he says, my God and your God, there is no definite article. It's and God of me and God of you. If we use the logic that if a noun lacks the definite article, it somehow makes it a something. So if there's no definite article before God, it makes it a God. We just ended up proving the Father is a God, and Jesus is God Almighty. Wow. Hmm. Hey, Acts 17, hater. You're the most boring channel with next to Christian Prince, and yet you get 900 people. The day will come. I'm going to surpass you by the grace of God. Hater. But anyway, you guys with me there? Hater Woods and the Hizzy. Hater Woods and the Hizzy. Okay. Now, I just want to make sure everyone got the point. And obviously, the lack of the definite article before a noun doesn't really mean that the noun itself becomes a something. That just tells you that the people who use that argument, like David Wood, don't know what they're talking about. There goes Artur Asad. Durian, my Armenian brother from a different uh, brother. Okay, but you want to make sure you're getting it. 
What did we establish thus far? John 20, verse 17 and 28, identifies the Father and His Son. The Father and His Son. Two different persons. They're not the same person. Both are said to be the God of the disciples. Both are the God of the disciples. But however, there's only one God that an Israelite can confess and worship. That's Jehovah, only one God. And the Father is the God of the disciples, so he must be Jehovah. But then Jesus is the God of Thomas. By extension, that makes him the God of the disciples. That he must be Jehovah as well. But Jesus is not the Father. And Jehovah is only one. Do you see why we're Trinitarians? Do you see why we're Trinitarians? Is it making sense before I move on? Do you want further proof that by calling Jesus his Lord and his God, further proof that by calling Jesus his Lord and his God, Thomas was identifying Jesus as Jehovah? Do you guys want further proof that by calling Jesus his Lord and his God, Thomas being an Israelite, a Jew, could only say that if Jesus is Jehovah? Because no Israelite who's a true Israelite no Jew who's a true Jew can call anyone besides Jehovah, his Lord and his God. You want the proof? Psalm 35, 23, especially in the Greek version. I'm going to get you the Greek version. Psalm 35, 23. Someone quoted. I'm going to show you what the Greek says. Notice what the psalmist says. Psalm 35, 23. Guys, pay attention. Please, I need you to follow this. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Did you catch it? Sorry, it's buffering. Okay, sorry, guys, we're buffering. Okay, did you guys catch it? Psalm 35, 23. Let's read it one more time. Psalm 35, 23. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Did you guys catch it? The psalmist says to Jehovah, you are my God and my Lord. Thomas says to Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. It's the same phrase. It's just the words are reversed. It's the same phrase. To say my Lord and my God is the same thing as saying my God and my Lord. Whoever is your God and your Lord, he is your Lord and your God. How could Thomas say to Jesus, my Lord and my God, being a Jew, knowing that in the Old Testament, Jehovah alone is an Israelite's Lord and God. And his worship of Jesus is identical to the way the psalmist glorifies Jehovah. The only difference is the words are reversed. That's it. But it's the same meaning, same phraseology. Just the words are reversed. In Psalm, he says, my God and my Lord. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Could it be any clearer, folks? Could it be any clearer? That Thomas is worshiping Jesus as Jehovah because the, the phrase, the wording, the confession that Thomas makes can only be made of Jehovah God if someone is a true Israelite, a true Jew. Oh, but it's going to get a little better. How did the Greek version of Psalm 35 translate? Adonai Elohei. It's actually in Hebrew. It's Elohei wa Adonai. Elohai Adonai. Everyone can pronounce it. That's the Hebrew. How did the Greek version translate that Hebrew of Psalm 35, 23? Here you go. Psalm 35, 23. Now, in the Greek version, Psalm 35 becomes Psalm 34. Don't ask me why. It, it's Psalm 34 in the Greek. Elohai wa Adonai. Here it is. The English translation of the Greek. Let's see how the Greek rendered Psalm 35, 23, which in Greek would be Psalm 34, 23. Let's look at it. He gave you the Greek. Click on the link. Let me get you the verse. And then we're going to look at the Greek. Okay. Now get ready. Bottom meat. Okay. Here it is. 
the English translation of the Greek rendering of Psalm 35, 23. In the Greek, it's Psalm 34, 23. My God and my Lord. Here's what it says in the Greek. Ah, theosmu, k or kai, ah, kuriasmu. Wow. Even the Greek is identical. The Greek of Psalm 35, 23 says, ha, theosmu, kai, ha, kuriasmu. Sorry, I'm getting buffering. In Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus Christ cover us. The blood of Jesus. Okay. The Greek, 1611, everyone else. The Greek translation of the Hebrew, Elohai wa Adonai. The Greek is ha theosmu kai ke ha kuriasmu. Identical to the Greek of John 20:28. John 20:28 says ha kuriasmu. Ke kai ha theasmu. The Greek of Psalm ha theasmu kai ha kuriasmu. It's identical. Wow. So here, let me transliterate. Before 23, the Greek is ha theasmu ke kai ha o kurias kurius. Okay. God of me, the Lord of me. That's how it's in the Greek. John eat in the Greek is ha kuriasmu kai ke ha theasmu. Identical. What more proof could I give you? What more proof could the Holy Spirit give us to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear? That the way Thomas confessed Jesus is a confession that can only be given to Jehovah God Almighty. Which means that Thomas realized, though Jesus is not the Father, he's not the Father, he's the Father's Son, they're different persons. Jesus is just as much God as the Father is, and Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. Because you cannot say to a preacher, the Lord of me and the God of me. No God-fearing believer could say that of a creature that would be blasphemy i know pistol pete i know native greek speakers pronounce it as o but when you listen to christians who teach the greek new testament they always teach their students that when you see that little like line on top of the word O, it's a breathing sign, so you're supposed to say ho, ho, or ha. That's how they teach it. It's called the Erasmian pronunciation. That's why we need you Greeks. We need you Greeks to take over the seminaries and colleges and correct the butchering of the Greek pronunciation. You want me there? But everyone understood the implication of Thomas's confession, a confession directed to Jesus. There's no way around it grammatically because it says he said to him, him, Ipen, auto, auto, him, not to someone else. And Jesus then accept that confession. He didn't say, Thomas, how could you say I am your Lord and your God? I just got done telling Mary Magdalene, the Father's your God. He's my God. Why then would you say, I am your Lord and your God? What's wrong with you? He didn't say that. He said, now you've believed? You had to see and believe that? Blessed are those like you and me who do not see and believe that Jesus is our Lord and our God. Wow. Okay. Just sum up so you guys don't lose the point. Jesus is the Son of God in a unique manner, in a different manner than believers are. Jesus is the essential Son of God. He is by very nature the Son of God, the true spiritual offspring of God. God is his Father by nature, whereas his disciples, being human creatures, are the children of God by grace, through adoption. The Father 
is the God of the disciples by their very nature as creatures. Because they are creatures, by their very nature, they have a God over them. Jesus only had a God when he became man and took on a human nature. Because when he became flesh, from the moment of his adopting a human nature, taking on a human nature, God, who was his father, then became his God as well. But before he became flesh, he didn't have a God over him. He simply had a father over him. God was his father. But when he became man, the father became God to him. Psalm 34, 23. No, I am legend. And the Greek, it's Psalm 34, 23. Don't argue with me. It's right here. Here's the link. I just quoted it, and here's the link. Psalm 34, 23 in the Greek. Here's the link. I am legend, not you, sir. Okay, don't argue with me because I'm the legend, baby. And he just quoted the Greek. The Greek is Psalm 34. The Hebrew would be Psalm 35. Okay, so did everyone understand? When you read John 20, 17 in context, it has a lot of meat proving the Trinity, proving Jesus is not the Father, proving that Jesus is one with the Father in essence and glory and majesty, proving that Jesus' relationship to God is different from the way the disciples relate to God, all of which refutes Islam, proves Muhammad is an antichrist. Right? Was that clear? So is the church right that Jesus is the only son of God? Yes, because they got it from the Bible. Is the Bible right that believers are children of God? Yes, both statements are true. Because when you say that Jesus is the only son of God, you don't mean God doesn't have other children. The word monogenes means he's uniquely born, uniquely begotten. He is God's begotten son that is unique. There is no other son like him because he is the son by nature who eternally exists as the true spiritual offspring of God, whereas everyone else is a son by grace or by creation, where God creates them and gives them life and sustains them. So in that sense, he's their father. And then in the sense of adopting them to share in the sonship of Christ, God willing, I'll unpack that more tomorrow. Yeah, I'm she. Father, Son, Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus cover us. Okay. Let me repeat that point because it buffered. Okay. Jesus is the true essential son of God. He's the only son of God in that he is the uniquely begotten son. Unique in that there is no other son like him. He is the eternal son who's always been the son of God, who's a true spiritual offspring of God. Whereas everyone else is either a child by creation, meaning God created them and gives them life and sustains them, or by adoption through faith in Jesus. So the reason why we call him the only son or the only begotten son, it's not because we're denying their other sons. We're denying their other sons like him. He's in a category all by himself, unique, no other son like him. That's what we mean when we call him only son or only begotten son. Yep, a true spiritual offspring of the father that has always existed as the son to the father, Kevin. And that's that's easy to demonstrate. So is that clear? Because God willing, I'm going to do a part two tomorrow. I want to leave you with this. If everything was clear by the grace of the triune God, all glory to the triune God for everything good, everything imperfect, sinful comes from us. If that's clear, hit the like button. Go back, re-listen to this session and other sessions. Learn the arguments, absorb them, pass them on, download them to your YouTube channels, and share them. Until every Muslim knee bows and every Muslim tongue confesses and every creature worships the Father, Son, and Spirit as the one true God and confess that Jesus Christ is Jehovah, God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, yet one with them in essence, glory, power, and majesty. Okay? Is that clear? So Lord willing, I'm going to do part two tomorrow. I hope it blessed you and whet your appetite. Now, guys, pray. Pray for my daughters and I that God will bring us together and keep us together until Jesus calls me home, that God will keep them perfectly healthy and provide overly abundantly for my daughters, my angels, to flood them in the love of Jesus, that they will outlive me if the Lord tarries, 
Pray God helps me to get healthier and holier and more in love with him. Give me more wisdom and knowledge, understanding that he'll provide for the ministry so I can keep doing live sessions, keep writing papers and go around doing Bible studies and teach and that he'll plant me here and save me from all these satanic attacks. So please pray and pray hard and even fast for me and my daughters. That the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will wash us in the blood of Jesus and seal us by the Spirit and pray for extra provisions for this month because February 15, I move in my new place and I'm going to need the provisions for, for utilities and everything to hold the fort until my other brother joins me. Pray for his traveling mercies to join me sometime in March. So pray for that, for additional support above and beyond what I make, which isn't much, but I'm not complaining. As long as God provides my daily bread and takes care of my girls, that's all that matters. So pray for that. And if the Lord stirs you up and stirs your hearts and you want to contribute, you know how to do it, Patreon or PayPal. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're in love with you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because you're in love with us. Bless us, purify us in the blood of Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Purify our motives, not to be crowd pleasers, not to tickle ears, and never to sell ourselves for fame or fortune. Save us from our flesh. Save us from Satan. Save us from the world. Keep us in love with you. Make us bold lions and lion lionesses, living the faith, proclaiming the faith, loving the faith, defending the faith, and dying for the faith, the faith that comes from you. Bless us, Father. Lord Jesus, bless us. Holy Spirit, bless us and bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters, Father. Bless my daughters, Lord Jesus. Bless my daughters, Holy Spirit. And bring them to me and provide for us. To never be beggars of men, but beggars of you, our merciful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Father, have mercy. Father, have mercy. Father, have mercy. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Yahovah, Rafa, Yahovah, Rafa, Yahovah, Rafa. In Jesus' name. Love you guys. God willing, see you tomorrow. Pray for me, my daughters. Pray for my health and holiness, their health, and pray for the provision. I need some extra provision to get planned in my new place. God is good all the time. We love you, Lord Jesus. Take care.